In this video, we are talking about the people mover. Can Disney bring this thing back? There's been a lot of misconceptions over the decades that it's been closed. Um, some things that fans thought were a fact are maybe not so much a fact. And we're also going to dive into some content creators that Vash and myself watch that you might not be aware of. And we're going to have a little fun at the end of the show talking about that all up next on OG55. <laughs> May I have your attention, please? Welcome to the, another episode of OG55. We're talking Tomorrowland's People Mover at Disneyland. Can they bring it back? What's the stat? What's the uh, current status of the track and the infrastructure? We got a lot to talk about in regards to that. We're also going to dive into some content creators that Vash and myself watch that you might not be aware of. And, and I think that's going to be a very interesting uh, segment part of this show at the tail end that I think you guys and gals will definitely enjoy. But before we get started and begin the festivities, I want to introduce my co-host, my producer, my good friend, Vash Sky, host of the Freshly Squeezed show here on OG55. Hey, I do appreciate the intro, sir. Um, this was uh, this this is gonna be a pretty fun one today. Uh, I you know we I uh, called you I think I think it was earlier last week, right? Saying, "Oh man, this would be a cool video," and now it's finally come, and, and I'm I'm super excited to talk about the the topics and and to highlight some uh, some some YouTube content creators. You know, uh, some of them in the theme park space, but some of them outside of theme park space. So yeah. I think that's going to be really, really fun. So I really do appreciate you having me on, sir. Uh, well, if you want to go ahead and follow me, you can go ahead and do so right down there at Vash Sky on Twitter. And uh, as you'll find out on this show, sometimes what happens on Twitter gets made into a video. So you definitely want to go ahead and uh, and and follow that for, as Christine Waysons McCarthy would say, for all the robust discussion. And there's the biggest bargain of all. Oh, I love it. I love it. Absolutely <laughs> love it. I <laughs> love that drop. If you know that drop and where it came from, you know, and you're laughing right now, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, hey, if you want to see me, well, it's going to be on the channel you're watching right now at Orange Go 55 at Freshly Squeezed, your source for juice and news and info, squeezed fresh right from the grove. Pay attention, it's show time. It is show time. OG, take it away. Perfect, perfect. So we're going to Tomorrowland, and we're going to talk about the People Mover. Now, Dre came across a fantastic uh, tweet, actually. <laughs> a fantastic tweet. Very eye-opening from, well, uh, you know, I'll go ahead and share your screen, Dre, and then I'll let you do the honors, kind of uh, give us a little context, and, and we'll go from there. Yes. Okay, so I will go ahead uh, and tell you what this is all about. All right, so um, we have a you know a, a, you know there's just Twitter out there, right? And you got everybody with the with the hot takes and saying all kinds of stuff, and uh, it can lead to some interesting discussion. And in this case, it actually did. Uh, Sam Carter, who's actually been on the show before in the past, put out a tweet. Uh, who's you know great by the way, awesome. Got to give him the uh, OG55 fist bump right there. Good stuff. Um, he put out a tweet saying, "Move the carousel progress back to Disneyland." It's kind of a um, you know, it's like, yeah, like, you know, uh, that would be nice. But, uh, but uh, you know, it's kind of one of those tweets, you know, it's going to get a lot of likes and, 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 and may generate some discussion. In this case, it did. One person who replied said this, and it caught my eye. In 2013, I was a contract engineer. I'm part of a team that looked at restoring the people mover track. Oh, interesting. We did a proposal, but they couldn't decide what to do with the Carousel Progress building. One idea was to remove the Tomorrowland Center track and platform and use the second floor of the Carousel Progress building for guest loading. Hashtag broken dreams. And you can see here, he actually has a map, which we'll, we will go over in some more detail. Don't, <laughs> don't, get, don't get it twisted. However, it caught my attention because it was like, oh, whoa. I seem to remember... You know, maybe uh, spitballing an idea on this show very similar to this, uh, which I 
kind of, I responded with. I said, I mentioned an idea strikingly similar similar to this on, you know, the show you're watching right now, Orange Code 55, please subscribe, uh, a few months back when discussing the recent rumors regarding the people mover. It blows my mind that it was actually considered almost 10 years ago now, and I'd be fascinated to hear what other proposals were, pros, cons, and so forth. I think we all would. But uh, uh, to, to highlight this, well, here's that clip here from a show that we did uh, when we were originally examining uh, the rumors regarding the people mover uh, earlier this year. So I'll go ahead and play that for you right now, just to give you guys an, uh, some context. There's a, there's a, there's a couple of ways they can go with this for sure. If I was kind of the accountant looking to do it uh, the most uh, fiscally responsible way, let's say, <laughs> right? I might utilize that carousel of progress building, like you said, yeah. and make maybe even the top portions of it the load station, right? Right. Um, you know that gets you that gets you elevated. There's enough space to do that. I think it already has an elevator built in. Um, you go ahead and make the top of that either Q space or or like you said, maybe a maybe a show scene or two, right? Before it actually makes its way out and starts to on its tour to Tomorrowland. If you do that, what happens to the the uh, old monorail? Pl uh, I'm sorry, uh, people mover platform. Right? Do, do we re reuse that in some way? Do we reconfigure that? Uh, do we even go down that far? Uh, it, it's there's there's a lot of ways this can go. There's a there's a there's a couple of ways. And so that's uh, as you can see, you know, the people mover track might be I don't know removed, reconfigured, whatever. Well, apparently, the sky <laughs> sky looked at doing that. Um, wow. He did respond. With it, with some with some interesting information, however, and uh, again, this is kind of why we want to talk about it on the show. Uh, but uh, b before we get to that, uh, OG, what do you think about this so far? Well, no, I think that's a great I, that's a great idea, and I think they should definitely. I mean, if they if they are really seriously considering bringing the people mover back, I think that's definitely an option they should consider. It kind of kills two birds with one stone. We get mm -hmm. the people mover back, number one, but number two, we utilize that building for something worthwhile it's not just like a rental space you know it, it like you know uh for 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 things to go in and out of it's actually for, used for a permanent um attraction a beloved attraction and i think that you can do a lot with that building because it is in indoors you can have great show lighting some really cool stuff in there while you wait for your people mover i would absolutely love that disney if you're watching think about that definitely do it because i think yeah. that would be an amazing load station it, potentially Oh yeah, absolutely. And look, the company's all about reusing infrastructure. I mean, you know, they're they're you know they they reimagined what uh, Maelstrom into Frozen, right? Uh, Tower of Terror into Gardens of the Galaxy Mission uh, uh, Mission Breakout. Uh, they reused um, pretty much all of the building from Universe of Energy to to create uh, Gardens of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. You know, we've seen them do this before, and look. To give this kind of building a new lease on life in that way, I think it would be phenomenal. You already have an elevator located in that uh, in that structure, which was one of the big inhibitors as to why the people mover hadn't come back. You you re you you really required ADA access for something like this. Um, so you you got an elevator. Uh, you have a, a huge interior space which you can have for both a loading station and and provide the space required to get some of those, uh, you know, guests with disabilities on board. No problem. That's one of the you know reasons why the people mover platform would have to be expanded if it did come back because you have to provide for those kind of things. Well, the Carousel Progress building is huge, so you can do that. You'd have an indoor queue, which people mover never had before. You just have all these advantages when you go that route, and that's kind of why, hey, look, listen, you know, if you want to be fiscally responsible about it, go ahead and do it this way. Right. But he went on to say this. And this was interesting. Uh, Danny B says, and this is again, this is I am Tigger too, on Twitter. My involvement was focused on the concrete track slash pylons only. We had no details on vehicle design, theme, or propulsion. Unfortunately, just removal of the rocket rod, tube, and hardware. Small repairs, then provide a surface ready for new track and side rail installation, which was to be announced. Now, when he said that last part, I was like. Wait a minute. We yeah uh, we had heard for decades uh, that you know uh, the the track was unusable. So this gentleman here was talking about how they would you know 
simply uh, scrape off what the what remains of the rocket rods exist on that platform or on that track specifically and then uh make it ready for a new uh, uh, attraction in its place whether that be a people mover type system or or or, or, or you know any any of number of its uh of its of its associated counterparts in the themed entertainment world and so it was like okay well but that goes contrary to what fans had kind of been led to believe about this that the tracks were simply unusable and had to be replaced not just outside but in some of these uh in interior spaces around tomorrowland uh and and OG, I'm, I'm sure you've heard the same thing. I mean, I've yeah. said the same thing on this show, so I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard it. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. It, it's It's been like, th- this is something that's been perpetuated in the fan circles, fan community, for literally since the Rocket Rods closed. It, it's been sort of like this, this kind of this known thing. The track is unsafe. That's why they can't bring the people mover back. It's not... It's not structurally sound and yada, yada, yada. We've heard this for decades. And this is one of those things where it's like you can't, this is why I take what the fan community at large says with a huge grain of salt mm. most of the time. There are there are people within the community who know what they're talking about. Absolutely. But the overall narratives a lot mm. of times are kind of bullshit, you know, because I remember and I've said it many times on this show, how many times leading up to Galaxy's Edge did we hear Disneyland cannot expand beyond the rivers of America because there's backstage buildings back there that they need. They cannot do without those. There's no way around that. They need it. Well, what did Disney do? They bulldozed. They got, they gained 15 acres to build Batu. right? All this time, all these decades, we were told it's impossible to do that. Disney freaking did it. That's it kind of reminds me of this people mover track thing. It's like the fans think they know it all. Okay, the track is unsafe, not structurally sound. And guess what? It's it's apparently fine. Like, look, like he said, he's going to cosmetically, you'd have to go ahead and, and, and touch it up and do what you have to do. But at the end of the day, it's not falling apart. It is safe to use. So that's why you got to you gotta have a lot of, you got to question things when, when, when you're going through this community because, um, a lot of times the information is wrong. People a lot of times don't know what they're talking about. And one person will say it, and then the next person will take what that other person said and and, and assume it's fact. And and that's yeah. how this whole game of telephone, you know, begins. And before you know it, it's it's a it's a for sure thing, right? It, it's you can't no disputing it, you know. No disputing it, right? And to to dispute it is heresy. I mean, you know, I, I and Look, I've been, I've fallen in that trap before. I've been the victim of that kind of thing before, oh, yeah. you know, and myself, myself included. We all yeah, have, you know, it, right, right. And it's just, you know, you just, I guess you just go along with the kind of accepted conventional wisdom on these things. But really, what you're taking part in is kind of this, what I call this fan created mythos, you know, that is just, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of it's kind of willed itself into being by the community even though it's not necessarily true and i asked him this i said this is unbelievably fascinating insight i very much appreciate you sharing uh your history and knowledge regarding this topic specifically but if i may ask were you able to determine if said concrete track and pylons were usable because what he had said kind of alludes to they were in your opinion are the rumors regarding the track damage by rocket rods true And he said this, the pylons track and supports were fine. Mostly cosmetic was small spalls and cracks, but completely certainly safe with the rebar and concrete. It would take quite the effort to wreck them. Photo here is a similar support. We tore apart then restored, not Disney. We had to waterproof the rebar. This is a guy who got up close and personal with these things who actually examined them and actually laid eyes on them, laid eyes on the damage, right? Got his hands on it and can actually determine uh, with a degree of certainty that, yeah, they're, they're, they're fine. And we had been listening to fans, you know, I guess repeat, uh, I, I, I suppose rumors and speculation about that until it created kind of its own thing. But, we never got to hear from people who actually examined this kind of stuff and analyzed this stuff. And and in this case was actually analyzing to the point where they were looking to replace it with something as early as 
as far back as 2013, which is um, <laughs> quite crazy how this all uh, this whole thing kind of works. Yeah, no, that is crazy. And it makes you really reconsider all the narratives in the community, not just with the people mover track, but mm. everything you're 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 you know, the uh, you know, the, the the narratives in regards to Bob Chapek, what's out there in the fan community. That's fact that's just that's just the way it is that kind of stuff uh, your, your the narratives in regards to just just about everything it, it really does make you sit back and question everything and it's uh it's pretty profound this is something that like i'm telling you, if you've been in the fan community for any amount of time i mean this mm -hmm. is something that it's been out there for literally since the rocket rods closed in 2001 everyone yep. believed that these supports were not safe now in hindsight in hindsight, that really never made a whole lot of sense because if they really were unsafe, mm -hmm. Disney would tear them down. They're not going to risk having these tracks literally over guests' head and right. they're not structurally safe. That would be a huge risk on Disney's part and they would most likely have to destroy those. They cannot have guests in and around and under them if they were not safe. In hindsight, that makes sense. But for all these years, we all believe they just were not safe. And uh, it's pretty funny that they actually were, or actually are. Right. Well, and and honestly, the, the answer was right in front of our faces. Had they not been usable at all, they would have been removed a long time ago. Exactly. Right? I mean, it's like, why keep them around if they are unsafe and we would have to get them get rid of them anyway, regardless of, regardless of whether or not we were actually putting uh, something on them to 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 uh, or, or replacing them with something else. You know, you had to get rid of them. And the fact that they didn't would it, you know, should have told you, oh, yeah, they're keeping them around because they are still usable. It's like, Ugh. Um, however, this brings up an interesting conversation and, and one that we probably should have following the uh, let's say, uh, let's do it. The D23 Expo. Uh, following um, what was in the Tomorrowland context, a lackluster expo, let's say, yeah. um, I, I think it's kind of important to kind of, uh, you know, go through uh, this plan right here and, and what, you know, what they were what they were kind of theorizing back then and whether or not, uh, you know, maybe this impacts decision making today. Let's see if I can open this new tab. I can. And then let me go ahead and expand it out. I can do that, too. So that was I thought this was interesting, and, and this is kind of this is kind of what I had kind of theorized myself when uh, thinking about using the Carousel Progress building. If in fact you do use that building, there's no real reason to take that stretch down and back. You can just go ahead and remove just that section of track, get rid of that. You can open that uh, in you know um, um, center space up in the middle of. Uh, Tomorrowland, if you were to get rid of the people mover and uh, uh, rocket jets platform, and then that way you can go ahead and go around it. But there's there's other notable things on this map that are really really interesting, and maybe it's because you know they you know the team who actually uh, worked this up maybe they found some some issues that they were having to uh, engineer around and so forth. If you look at the very uh, bottom of this image right here, which shows in kind of a blue pan, blueprint aerial uh, photo of Tomorrowland. You'll see that it does go through the Star Tours building like it, it always had. But instead of kind of taking a turn and going into Space Mountain proper, it does not. It actually uh, comes out uh, like the uh, <laughs> from like the side of uh, Star Trader and kind of uh, kind of hugs the side of like uh um the 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 kind of the top edge of the magic eye theater and then it kind of curves around what is now kind of alien pizza planet and goes right back into the uh carousel progress building oh gee what do you what do you think about this uh you like this uh you know what what were they what were they trying to engineer around what do you think about it, all this? It's fascinating that it wouldn't go through this. That it wouldn't go through the um, the Space Mountain building. Um, I like that aspect of the People Mover. I like going through these attractions. I think that's part of the uh, the charm and the magic of it, so to speak. Uh, it's interesting though that they that they it's it's sort of it was rerouted to just kind of be 
you know, um, kind of come come around the front of Space Mountain like that. That's that's fascinating. Um, I don't know. I mean, I dig it. I mean, look, I'm I'm a people mover guy. Uh, any form in which we get the people mover back, I'll be happy. If they if they if they want to reroute it, reach, you know, uh, change the the layout, it's all good as long as it goes around Tomorrowland proper. I'm happy. In terms of the whole back end, oh, you know, the the spaghetti bowl as they call it with the monorail track on Autopia and all that. Mm -hmm. I think that's really a waste back there. Um, mm -hmm. it, most of that back there didn't really see, didn't really seem very Tomorrowlandy to me anyway. Um, and it really wasn't much to look at, to be honest. It was very much an eyesore. So I would prefer them to actually get rid of that whole people mover track back there, remove it, shorten that monorail track and all that, and, and put something more fantasy land related in there, maybe like Frozen, which is the rumor. But uh, yeah, I don't, for me personally, I'm not really big on, I'm not really married to the, to the old people mover track layout. I'm not really m mentally married to it. So mm -hmm. if they want to alter that track and bring it back, by all means do that by all means. And, and, and it might even be for the best, to be honest with you, the, the less attractions, even though it's cool to go through the attractions, the less attractions it goes through, it might be for the best in terms of like um, being able to, what's the word for it? Like maintain it and, and yeah. all that, where you're not, where you're not connected so much to all these various other attractions. You know, it might be for the best to sort of create a little bit more separation, even if you just take it out of space mountain or, or maybe space mountain and something else, it's maybe good to kind of separate that because as of right now, it's so interwoven with everything. Yeah. It kind of does complicate things. It kind of does. It does. It does. And uh, it would, for those reasons, that's why I, I'm, I kind of like understand the route they're going. Yeah. They're looking to lessen the compli you know, the complications that would otherwise impede a, uh, a project like this, you know, and, and if it means not going through Space Mountain, I'm personally okay with that. Right. Also, too, we don't really know if the track inside uh, Space Mountain was preserved during the 2005, uh, uh, right. you know, redo and rebuild, let's say, you know, we, we, we have no idea on that, which also kind of like, Hey, um, what, you know, what's going on with like the interior of, uh, uh like Buzz Lightyear Astro Blasters, for example. Right. Um, and, and whether or not that was, uh, that portion was, was actually preserved. It looks like, and I have, I had heard that it was surprisingly enough, but, you know, 2013, this is, um, what's, uh, eight years after Buzz Lightyear Astro Blasters opens in 2005. Um, you could see that they were still going through that building, which lends credibility to the idea that, yeah, that, that portion of the people mover track was preserved and possibly something they could, uh, explore again in the future when it came to, uh, a people mover replacement. I do agree with you. Um, the northern section of Tomorrowland, you know, um, look, as much as I love the spaghetti bowl and I love the Autopia, uh, you know, how it goes back there, you know, and, and has those winding, twisting uh, 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 roadways and so forth that makes makes it so distinct from uh, Autopia attractions all over the world. And, and I would love for the people mover to go back there. It is kind of an inhibitor to... A, a, a future expansion, you know? I mean, we talk about this frozen uh, kind of themed land. Where would that go? It would likely go there, and let's be honest, some of that stuff needs to be removed. So yeah. I think if we were looking at a plan like this today uh, with the kind of idea that we could expand in those areas, uh, you know, utilizing a, a franchise or IP, well, probably the northern end of that people mover. Uh, track is probably cut off it probably you know as it comes out of carousel progress um you know maybe it, it, it you know, has kind of a straight line but then it starts to curve into and hug the side of that people that uh, uh monorail platform and then it, it goes on its journey uh into buzz lightyear and so forth that's kind of the route i think it would take nowadays because it's just yeah, that's a lot of land back there, and I don't know if anybody's noticed, but Disneyland doesn't have a, a, a lot of land to spare. So I, I think that would be uh, that'd be part of it. And I had heard ideas of, of, of getting rid of the spaghetti bowl uh, for the um, uh, for the monorail for for a, a long time now, for a number of years, and that seems to be the most likely way they're going about this. But but overall, this plan right here, not bad. 
This is no. not bad. It's not bad at all. No, no, it's not. It's not. Now, um, I don't know if you have it on you, and it mm-hmm. probably wouldn't be too hard to find it if if you don't. The attraction, I think it's Islands of Adventure that I brought to your attention the other day. Yes. Yes, let me go ahead and bring that up right now. We'll go ahead and explain it for the audience. No, I think because w- w- there's been a lot of talk around what kind of modality, you know, what will 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 di- mechanism will Disney use to kind of propel the people mover through Tomorrowland? You know, they might they, they might not necessarily use the old, you know, tire system. They probably won't, to be honest with you. And the yes. and the magnetic system they use in Walt Disney World, from what I understand, is not very reliable. So our friend. Um, Haston mm-hmm. on Twitter uh, mm-hmm. tweeted this picture. And when I saw this, I immediately thought, you know what? That wouldn't be a bad idea for the people mover. And Dre, to your credit, you've mentioned something similar on this show about using roller coaster track. Mm-hmm. This would be pretty cool. You could dress up a people mover pretty nicely. And I could see this going through the land. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I like it. I dig it, actually. This is kind of a, this is kind of a unique attraction for uh uh, for Universal in general, they really don't have. They really don't normally specialize in scenic type uh, ride experiences like this, uh, which which Disney has done many times in its past. And honestly, if you follow this attraction, which I am blanking on the name right now, I do apologize. It is in their Dr. Seuss uh, uh, kind of themed area. Um, it kind of you know it's not really a roller coaster. I mean, it kind of. You know, does the people mover thing? It's kind of this elevated uh, uh, kind of uh, scenic tour of this land, and gives you an idea of not just what's going on within the attractions themselves, but an aerial view of the people overhead and shops and so forth. I mean, it's is you know, it's it is quite interesting. Uh, this is kind of why I brought up the idea of a kind of a, a roller coaster track uh, type setup because, let's be honest, I mean, uh, creating something like that is very straightforward. All things considered, um, you know, I, I believe Mac Rides uh, has a version of this, and that might be the version you're seeing on screen. I haven't confirmed that. Might be Intimate or somebody, but you know, who knows? Anyway, it's it's fairly easy to do. Um, it's fairly easy to expand or alter if you need to make those uh, if you need to make those changes. Let's say, hey, let's say for example, you get rid of the track to the north as we talked about right in the spaghetti bowl uh in the northern part of tomorrowland but let's say well now that we have the layout of everything adjusted for um uh, for for this kind of frozen land uh you know maybe we can give people uh you know a, a, a view into it that doesn't necessarily degrade the view from within right now you can make that adjustment quite easily with or with a roller coaster track configuration you just kind of add that track on boom 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 and then and you're good to go and you're out of there uh, that's you know that's why I, I'm you know I'm all about flexibility modular uh, systems. Well, <laughs> roller coaster track that's kind of what it is, and uh, some uh, what is it uh, um, companies and corporations already produce a system like this. We can see it in Islands of Adventure, but we could also see it in uh, Yoshi, uh, uh, an attraction that Universal Studios has created already in. Yeah, Universal in their Japan site, I believe Universal Osaka, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, what they are cons- currently constructing for Epic Universe. Uh, we can also we we can we can see the track uh, that's going to be used for that, and it's very similar to to what you see on screen right now. So it's like this is it right here. This this is your your next people mover right there. Right. Yes, it wouldn't be the original Bobker design, but it would be something that would be. That you could easily maintain that isn't like a custom fabrication, right? That you can order parts for from these uh, uh, um, the, for these companies who who specialize in this and so forth. Um, you could expand it, contract it, adapt it, alter it, whatever, quite easily. And it's a it's a it's a it's a proven method. I mean, here you go. This is it right here. Yeah. You're looking at it. Yeah, and, and ironically, these vehicles look like very Susy versions of Disneyland's People Mover. It's kind of funny. Yes. I'm sure that's not by coincidence. I think it, maybe they they are paying a little bit of an homage, but you can definitely do this, and I think it would be a pretty cool, um, a pretty cool way to bring the people mover back. Mm-hmm. It, it's different, it's fresh, yeah. yeah, but it's similar enough to the original where it's still in the same. It's kind of still cut from that same cloth, you know. It's yeah. not. It's not like the rocket rods that are vastly different. I mean, this is still right. very people moverish. 
you know, despite the fact you're using a different track system and all that. So it's pretty cool. Exactly. I, I support it. And to uh, softly transition uh, into the, the next segment of this video, I wanted yeah. to go ahead and highlight uh, LNG vids here, uh, who uh, recently restored a, a great uh, 60 FPS VHS recording of uh, of the uh, people mover as it existed. Uh, this looks like to me, if I had to peg it down, probably 92. Let's see if I got that right. 87. Oh man. Wow. Uh, uh, Should have. I uh, look kind of like the 80s, but <laughs> but you know, I was I was close. Come on. Guys. Um. Uh, anyway, uh, this is kind of that. I'll go ahead and mute it here. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm muted. I'm muted. Wow. Uh, so this is kind of what this was all about, uh, just to give an idea of uh, <laughs> some of our viewers probably haven't seen the people mover <laughs> <No>. <laughs> at all. So this kind of gives an idea of what this uh, this attraction was all about. Now, um, the 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 what makes this distinct from Walt Disney World's version is that Walt Disney World's version uses kind of a linear induction system. The, you literally have like magnets embedded in the ground, and magnets embedded in the vehicles that uh, you know uh, that will be, uh, kind of a reverse polarity type system that will push against each other, and that's it creates kind of a, a, a levitating type system, and a lev uh, and uh, based on the kind of um, the, 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 the energy that you put through these magnets, that will give you your propulsion as well. A couple of things, though, and you can see that right there. You see that kind of, that uh, people mover sweeping into that, that, that prior section in the, in the background there. You can see it right there. Yeah. See how it's kind of at kind of elevated grade? Well, Disney World could never do that. It can't go up and down grade, which for a system like, you know, uh, Disneyland, you would need to do that. Right. And that's yeah. kind of why they haven't adopted that same Walt Disney World system. The other thing, too, is, is there's, there's a limited amount of control with the Walt Disney World system, as we have kind of heard stories of of uh, you know, <laughs> people movers crashing into each other and so forth. It illustrates the point that for a kind of modern ride system, particularly as exists in the litigious state of California, uh, you would probably oh. want a lot more granular control over these things uh, than what could have been provided. Uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. So a roller coaster system, however, would overcome both those issues. You know, you obviously can do grade, roller coaster, <laughs> and yeah. uh, it could provide you the, um, uh, uh, what is it, the, 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 uh, um, the control that you would require uh, for a modern day attraction. So it just, if it's all of those things, guys, yeah. I'm just telling you, that's, that's probably going to be the system they go with. I hope so. I really hope so. It makes the most sense, and uh, it would just be great to have the People Mover back, a next gen version of the People Mover. You know, I was thinking about it, and it's like mm -hmm. there are there are people, you know, f subscribers, fans of this channel watching this, right? Because you mentioned a lot of fans might not might not have ever been on this. I yeah. mean, if you were born when the People Mover closed down. Ooh, look at that line for Star Tours. <laughs> oh, my God. Crazy. Well, oh, it's definitely 1987, yeah. <laughs> All right, the 80s, yeah, man. Star Wars opening, was king back then. Opening year of Star Tours, 1987. So, Oh, and, oh, geez, Space Mountain. Man, oh, whew, okay. All right. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, no worries, OG. no worries. No, I was going to say that, like, if you were born when when the People Mover closed, yes. Um, yeah, you, you you're like out of college already. Like, I mean, that's how long this thing has been gone. I mm -hmm. mean, it's it's crazy. You're pushing thirty. <laughs> like, it's yeah. You know, it's a it's a this it closed a long time ago. So there's a lot of people that watch our content that seriously have never been on this. You know, I'm I'm older. I'm 43, mm -hmm. and my um recollection of it is a little foggy. Even you know, I mean it. Yeah. it, it it was a long time ago. It really was. It was a long time ago. I mean, even myself. I mean, I'm I'm 32, so it closed when I was. I believe it closed in 95. I believe, I believe the there. Day. 95, 96, so, around that. Do the math, guys. I was about five yeah. years old when this thing closed. I, and and uh, we would we would go on it. Uh, 
you know, uh, with some frequency, but not with the level of frequency to really kind of embed it into my mind. So, right. uh, I mean, I'm going through this footage and it's like, you know, some things I recognize, some things I don't. And, and this here, going to the Star Tours section, this is kind of what we mean by it actually went through attractions. Yeah. And that track, by the way, within Star Tours, still there. Uh, it went through the Star Trader, for example. You can see that right there. And it did yeah. go through the, uh, uh, you know, areas of uh, uh, adjacent to and in space mountain and stuff like that and this was this was a really kind of cool. cool idea and it was it reflected a kind of mindset of this kind of optimistic future but a but a world on the move kind of thing and yes. it was kind of it was it was really cool and and I, I need some more kinetics. We need more kinetic energy. Yeah. Uh, we we know what happens when a, a, a land doesn't have any kinetics at all. Kind of ends up like Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, which if right. anybody criticizes that land, that's usually the point that they kind of start. <laughs> and then they go into the lack of uh, uh, characters from around the saga. That's a whole other story. Um, but, but Tomorrowland especially, I think, really benefits from from having a kind of world on the move kind of mentality like that that philosophy reflected in the kinetic energy of that land that'd be kind of cool to get back you know 100 percent, 100 percent. so let's pivot now to the uh next segment of of today's show which is content creators that vash guy and myself watch that you might not be aware of some pretty interesting content creators now not all of these creators are in the disney space they're not even really they're not even necessarily connected to nerd culture, mm -hmm. you know, like Star Wars or Marvel or nothing like that. Just great content creators from just all many different walks of life and just everywhere that we find interesting that we want to want to bring to your attention. So, how do you want to do it? We're going to do one from me, one from you and kind of alternate. Yes. You want to so, start us off or I think you have 3, I have a little bit more. Yeah. So I'll start. Yeah. And that way, yeah. And we'll uh, alternate. Yeah, and usually I would, I, I I would defer to you, good sir. But I think it would, it, it might work, work better if we if we, we do it that way. Um, now, who, who is this? So I can give I can tag him. Yes, this is Nomadic Fanatic, and uh, you know, like the name implies, he's a nomad and a nomad that doesn't really have any dwelling per se. He, I think he just bought, bought a parcel of land in Arizona. So that's like, you know, that's kind of unusual for these types because what they do is they continuously travel around the U.S. And cool. um, either in a van or an RV and continually kind of uh, uh, fixed up along the way. I mean, they're... You know they're uh, they're they're kind of uh, the, the old frontier spirit, let's say, embodied <laughs> in kind of a modern context. It's very kind of interesting stuff. But uh, nomadic fanatic, uh, he's Disney fan himself. That's actually how I I, I kind of uh, found him. Uh, he actually I think went to Walt Disney World with uh, Adam the Woo, and it was like, oh, this is kind of oh. this is really kind of interesting. This guy, but you follow him, and you know he's rarely at the Disney parks. He really just goes across the country in his RV, and his adventure are around where he's going and how he's getting there and how he's getting there really revolves around him fixing up his his rv it's like the millennium falcon almost there's always something going awesome. wrong right so it's kind of a fun little thing but um i'll go ahead and illustrate uh a, a kind of uh, you know how he captures this kind of whole thing what kind of uh tools and methods he uses and then we'll examine uh, uh kind of a montage that he creates every once in a while of his adventures that i think are kind of cool to highlight it seems like my GoPros are actually working. This is really awesome. I'm really going to test the limits here. Um, pop you guys up here into the uh, drones look here, and you can see us He's got down cameras, there. 360 I'm going to take off right his now RVs, and uh, his trailer, see if my drone will continue to uh, track me here. Uh, he's got this is actually a really good look there. for me to be able to uh, see how the trailer it's, looks behind the RV as well. It's, pretty, it's a pretty a kind of insane setup. I mean, you follow Nomadic here. Fanatic, uh, you'll have so a great said, time, and you'll have many angles by which you can follow this guy in his adventures. It's interesting because he has so many cameras that uh, when he gets into an accident, you know, which he recently did when he visited California, 
Uh, uh, that's a whole other yeah. story. Oh, yeah, now you can the only two accidents of my life have been in California. That that's, a, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, he, uh, he he had all these cameras around that really there documented the incident. You can go ahead and find that there. stuff on yeah, his channel. It's really, really kind of cool. But uh, you know, it goes into, uh, okay, I got got the solar you know, thing, works, right? Because if you're living on the on grid the on the edge, right? Yeah, I mean, power is kind of a kind of a deal, like, especially well, if you're going to go into northern climates with, you know, what is it? with go not to cut you off, go ahead and mute him. Oh, sure, sure. There you go. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry about that. I, I it, was hard, it was hard to make out with uh, both going on. Right, right, right. I, I do apologize. Yeah, yeah, good catch, OG. Um, but um, it, it's it's one of those things where, you know, it's like you got to really think about like, yeah. hey, if 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 you need power and you know you're in between gas stations, you know, how do you actually do that? You know, how do you do it cheaply, effectively? Well, you do it via. Uh, you, you do it via solar panels and you know how do you get heat well you do propane gas and it's like there's all this kind of cool, cool kind of crazy stuff that you encounter when you're on the road constantly that is a wow. muddy dirty river welcome to missouri heck yeah all right we're about a hundred miles into missouri now yeah that screen door is still rattling even though i jammed a sock between the door <laughs> and the screen still rattling back there He's so funny. And, and, um, and but, your, your, your description of it being the Millennium Falcon is completely spot on. Yes. That's exactly the kind of thing like Han would do in the Falcon. Oh, you know, I'm going to jam a sock over there when the, the, the thing is rattling. You know, it's, it's this hunk of junk kind of thing, but it's like his baby. I love it. Oh, I love it. I love it, too. Um, but he'll he'll take his many different cameras and sometimes he'll create montage videos the uh, of the places that he's staying at night. And it's really, really cool. Catch you guys in the morning with a, with a cup of coffee. All right, guys. Wow, just really, really cool stuff. Um, uh, it's 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 so cool to be able to kind of like experience these places with him. You know, go to like these sites and so forth that you wouldn't necessarily. He's got two cats, which he's very fond of. <laughs> you got to have somebody on the road with you. Um, uh, but. But uh, it's it's really cool to kind of see his adventures and kind of see how he kind of, you know, journeys with this with this whole thing and, and see the places that he experiences, see the see the, the, the different parts of, you know, the, the great United States and, and, and places where maybe you typically wouldn't go and so forth. And, you know, we, we, we talk about theme parks, right? But there's, you know, there's 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 california there's florida and there's 48 states <laughs> you know 40 other states that you can kind of visit and what what kind of adventures and uh areas do those have well uh nomadic fanatic is definitely the guy to uh to to experience that with so it's a well, pretty cool thing well and theme park people like like us right or, or just disney fans in general we, we all have a spirit of adventure in us you know i mean yeah. you know walt disney had that obviously you know that's what it inspired a lot of what he did Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's more to this whole thing we call life than just uh, California and Florida and, and more to this life than just the Disney parks and even just the, even beyond Universal Parks and what have you. And um, the, these kind of things, I love these kind of things, you know, traveling, going on these adventures, stopping at that little coffee shop in the middle of nowhere and, right. and meeting new people. And it's just that, that's, that is that is really that is magic. That really is something special. And uh, I. I never knew about him and i'm learning about him for the first time right now and i'll definitely um subscribe i, I love stuff like this man i absolutely hey, do i i i i knew you get a kick out of this because it is really cool the, like you said the spirit of adventure that that's that's that really distills uh nomadic fanatic down quite well he's he's he's, he's a great uh content creator he's been doing this for for a very long time his story is very interesting um and you kind of you, you you live through his adventures you know and, and sometimes he'll he'll do stuff like go to the racetrack you know or, or go to a disney park but a lot of times you know he's just he's just kind of out there and um it's kind of, it's 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 really great to see uh we have an expression now uh go out and touch grass <laughs> this is the kind of best virtual way to do that it's a lot of fun awesome awesome well great content creator i will definitely be mm -hmm. checking him out um i'll let you pick my next one because you, you have access to all the uh go ahead and pick it and i'll go I'll, I'll go ahead and uh kind of uh, uh let's do uh let's do uh let's 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 go back to uh, the, the the kind of nerd culture for just a second. Let's go to Melanie Mack here. Let's do it. Uh, she is uh, 
she is really uh she's really great she's really she's really something you just recently uh <laughs> you know i we had a live stream yesterday, which 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 highlighted her as well. But you recently just shared shared uh, her channel with me, and and it's 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 pretty phenomenal stuff. I hope you take it away. Yeah, I I actually just found out about her um, content like days ago, and I absolutely like I instantly became addicted to it. And I don't agree with her on everything, but you know mm -hmm. what? I don't really care. Like I'm not one of those people that like I, I seek validation my own opinion i like content creators i don't necessarily agree with yeah but there is a lot i gotta say there is also a lot that i do agree with her on i love her passion i've said this many times i love people with passion for anything she's got it like through the roof the passion is palpable when she talked about this stuff you can tell she's a nerd and she loves this stuff um she's very opinionated um she she's smart very, very funny as well, you know, crack you up. A lot of interesting takes in regards to nerd culture, in regards to the content, Marvel, Star Wars, Rings of Power, anything really. Very interesting takes where, you know, I, I've even said this for our, our friend Alia, who's been on the show many times, how Alia kind of always blows our mind with these different angles that, like, mm -hmm. we never consider. Well, Melanie Mac Go Boom is very much that kind of mindset where she uh, – will kind of bring stuff up like in regards to like she hulk or what various things that i'm like wow that's a fantastic point i've never ever considered that kind of perspective but she makes a lot of fucking sense you know so she's phenomenal we're gonna play a short little clip with her opinion on this whole kind of um i guess you would call i guess you would call it like the culture war going on right now with she hulk it's yeah. it's very much out there and I think she makes a phenomenal point. It's going to be controversial. Some people might not necessarily agree with her, but there's no doubt that she makes a fantastic, fantastic uh, point here. And uh, it's it's worth listening to. So this is a little taste of Melanie Mac Go Boom. Cool. Uh, let's do it right now. Um, but that said, they want to do that. They want to they want to push for that, and they want to say, "Oh well, this isn't made for you. This isn't made for you." Fair enough. Then they don't watch it, and when they don't watch it, the backlash is always, "Oh no, misogynists won't watch our show, won't watch our movie, so we're not a success because men are misogynists and don't watch it." It's just talking out of both sides of your mouth. First, you tell them not to watch it, then they don't watch it, and it fails. What do you expect to happen? Also, let's not be purely delusional here. When it comes to any type of superhero type show, any type of Marvel comics, DC comics, any comics like pro superhero property, mostly is supported by the male demographic anyway. That's true. Right. No, she's That's absolutely true. right. And, and, and a lot of these companies have a way of sort of like crapping on these like huge swaths of the population mm -hmm. that that they depend that they depend on and melanie brings up a great point you know it's like okay yeah but it's it's men it's 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 males that that are like a, a huge part of this comic book audience yeah not to say it's only men definitely not there's a lot of females out there you know what i'm saying that, that are into this stuff but a huge percentage is our males and mm -hmm. when you're going when you're actively kind of shitting on that demo you're gonna hurt your you're gonna hurt your your product right and she makes a great point too where and i've heard this before on social media where it's like mm -hmm. this isn't made for you yeah okay so it's not made for you but then if you don't watch it how dare you like what do you want then it's not made for me so i'm not gonna watch it but then you're mad at me for not watching it right so Again, fantastic point from Melanie. I, I think she hits the nail on the fucking head. Uh, oh. What do you think, Dre, in, in regards to like her opinion and and just her content in general and everything? No, her 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 opinion on this is sound. Look, I I never it never made sense to me. Like, look, if you're gonna if you're gonna especially in the like I said the comic book space, if you're gonna create content in the space, why would you not include? Uh, you know, uh, various demographics uh, to take part in this content. I mean, this is why, you know, it's kind of like, hmm, Disney used to create four quadrant content that used to appeal to everybody. This kind of thing where it's like, oh, we're, we're, we're going to be niche, but we're just going to be niche. Uh, all of you guys, you know, 
uh, it's not made for you kind of thing. It's a, we're going to push you back kind of thing. It's like, why? Why, why, why do that? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, you don't necessarily need to include everybody, but, but, but uh, you could still make it, uh, let's say, inclusive for everybody if they want to pick it up and watch. It's, it, it's very, it's a very strange thing. It's a very strange business model. I, I don't, I don't personally understand it. So I think Melanie Mac is completely spot on here, um, and that is maybe kind of why Rings of Power and She Hulk aren't doing uh, uh, quite as well, and especially when you compare it to Game of Thrones and some of the other um, yeah, shows that are out right now. So it's 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 uh, it's particularly interesting. But I like I like Melanie Mack's perspective. I think she comes at it in a in a kind of um, kind of a you know. Uh, uh, like, like, like common sense kind of, right. kind of way here. Uh, it, I think her analytical points are very, very sound. She'll actually make some interesting commentary on the culture and how those kind of cultural effects have uh, on on the content and vice versa and, and our interpretation of that content and so forth. I mean, it's 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 a really kind of interesting uh, interesting channel. It's not, you know, this is not your typical, uh, <laughs> let's say. Um, Oh, uh, I guess you can use the term "phantom menace" type content. Yeah, actually, definitely not. Is, you know, this is a little bit more uh, uh, cerebral and 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 and, and analytical, and I, I kind of like that. But it's also done with a really kind of funny, uh, quirky yeah. twist, and and I, I like that as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, she comes in. She comes in very, very, very spicy, and mm-hmm. and and she bring. But it's fun though. It's 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 not done in a in a in a in a nasty way or anything like that. She's very fun. Very. Very intelligent, very smart, um, mm-hmm. very witty, and uh, it, it's it's um, it's pretty awesome. Now, in regards to She Hulk, I know I know Dre, you haven't you haven't seen She Hulk, mm-hmm. um, and I'd like to, I'd like any 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 women female any females watching this, I'd like mm-hmm. you to comment down below with your opinion. Mm-hmm. I'm just giving you my perspective, okay? But it might be different. The female perspective might be different. I might be completely off base. Sure, but but the She Hulk show so far is really really weird. Because mm-hmm. it's kind of it's kind of pushing um, kind of this like um, you know feminist um, you know empowerment message for sure, mm-hmm. but at the same time it's sort of degrading to women. It's mm-hmm. very like it, it's this weird kind of like juxt- juxtaposition of these two things where it's like female empowerment, but then they're constantly sort of degrading women as well. Mm-hmm. And it, it's very strange. Now, females in the audience, what are your thoughts on that? If you've been watching she Hulk, am I off base with that? If I am, comment down below. No problem, you know? I, but from my perspective, from what I'm seeing, it's kind of that. It's really, really, it's a, it's a really, really strange show. Really, really strange show. Well, you know, uh, <laughs> you've, you've, uh, uh, uh recommend that i i watch this show uh I, especially with my with my with with my mom so i think i'm i'm going to do that and uh, i understand that there's some adult subject matter there <laughs> be kind of interesting to see how she reacts there but but um i i'd like to get uh, like you said i'd like to get a female's perspective when it comes to a show yeah. like this and, and and kind of see what she has to say obviously you know my mom i guess is a kind of a boomer you know this is kind of a uh, um uh what is it a, a very uh modern or even postmodern show we'll see we'll we'll see we'll see what happens and uh I, i'd like to go ahead and do a follow-up on that though uh, of course and and and, and kind of uh, um i do a review and analysis on she hulk she hulk when that when that time comes because i think it'll be for kind of a fascinating show so look out for that but melanie mack uh she she's I'm, definitely making me want to watch this show if only for the curiosity factor alone 100 percent, 100 percent. all right dre you're up next okay so uh you know Part of what we love to do is highlighting like criminally under sub channels, right? Yep. Just channels that are like, oh, how do you not, <laughs> you know, how do you not have more subscribers? This is ridiculous. Uh, this is one of those cases. So this is, uh, this is, I am for fun. And the really interesting thing about this guy is, don't be distracted by the woman in the background. It's okay. She is clothed. <laughs> it's all right. It's okay. However, he's worked in the themed entertainment uh, industry for quite a number of years uh, as both uh, you know, as kind of an executive, owner, operator, and so forth. I mean, this is quite an interesting perspective when it comes to what we do every single day, which is theme parks. And he kind of looks at the kind of – he will analyze a situation or a topic and kind of give his kind of uh, a unique perspective on that through his kind of executive lens, right? And he'll do it through the context of it's almost like having a board meeting with like, uh, you know, an, 
uh, an owner operator or executive with a theme park and just kind of going over it's like hey look listen you know this is what's going in our business and we might need to you know look at this or maybe this is you know not as serious as it you know uh that people kind of believe it to be or, or hey we have labor issues how can we com- you know how can we combat those how can we how can we um you know make up for those those losses how can we bring people back what steps we can do to to uh to to entice people to work for us and so forth you know it's just kind of all these things he's done this um with the, uh, Particularly, his last five videos have been just phenomenal. Uh, going on about Six Flags mm-hmm. <laughs> and about what's going on there. A lot of the information that I glean from that situation, as I re- have related on this show and on Theme Park Wizards Channel, uh, was 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 a commentary from this video. I, I you know I incorporated a lot into it because it it was just so phenomenal analysis. I hadn't really kind of thought about it from that perspective. He'll do this with kind of the labor market as you know <laughs> Disney's kind of contending with right now, as we famously now um he'll do this with uh fights even like the like the like the uptick in um guest uh uh what is it uh, uh confrontations and so forth right you know why might that be happening it's a really interesting analysis anyway i highlighted this kind of clip from this portion of the video because he talks about um you know it, it, the the subject of this video is is a softening in terms of guest attendance occurring right this is kind of something that we've speculated on this show This was done a couple of months ago, so some of this data is outdated, but you can kind of see how he does his thing. So I I think it's uh, a good representation of, of, of him as a content creator. We'll see a little bit of it. You judge for yourself. Really kind of cool stuff. Cool. But according to Reuters, U.S. travelers braved the skies with fewer flight delays and cancellations over the July 4th weekend. That's compared to the Memorial Day weekend in May. It was reported that nearly 9 million passengers made their way through TSA checkpoints across the USA. This was around 12% lower than 2019, but higher again than 2021 levels. That's a good metric to use in order to kind of see whether or not travel is abandoned or not, right? And I never would have thought about it, but he goes on. And what about hotel bookings? Coming into the holiday weekend, there were were reports in June that online travel agency traffic declined slightly, pointing to a possible softening and possibly making the rest of the 2022 season challenging for us. In fact, comparing May and June of this year to the same months in 2019, we see that the traffic for Airbnb went up by about 5% in May, but down 2% in June. Expedia traffic went down in both months, 8 and 17%. Booking.com was the only site to increase bookings month over month, and those were due to bookings in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. International travel? Mm -hmm. In Orange County, California, one of our major tourist destinations for the industry, Mm -hmm. they reported good news as of July 1st by saying that most hotels there have seen a big increase, including average weekend rates up about 20% from a year ago. This statistic, uh, I didn't know about that, but I definitely didn't know about this next one, which is relevant to us. And more good news. In May, these hotels had experienced a 70% boost in employees from the year prior, which means that employees are starting to return to work. Now, just this week, Orange County, down in Florida, the other major tourist destination, reported record tax collections from tourist hotels. While occupancy rates have been down from 2019, average daily hotel rates were over 16% higher in May 22 than 2021. So it, it, you can see yeah. how how he kind of like, hey, look, I'm an owner operator of uh, you know, a theme park enterprise. You know, how is the entire industry doing? What is what are the trends that we're seeing? What are the metrics that we can use to kind of predict, uh, you know, consumer patterns or or glean some insight into c- consumer behavior and, and all that kind of stuff? I mean, it's it's really good. Like I said, criminally undersub guys. If you are a fan of this channel. <laughs> You're going to be a fan of I Am For Fun, for sure. He doesn't put out a lot of videos, but what he has to say when he says it, it, it it's 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 gold, honestly. 
Yeah, no, I, I like his approach. It's very, very analytical. Mm -hmm. um, he's going based on data. He's going based on the numbers. You get a really good idea. And he breaks it down in a really kind of like consumable way. Yeah. You know, di you know, for, for the layman, right? Like, I, you know, I'm not really super versed, to be quite honest, with a lot of this stuff. And he breaks it down for you in a way that's like easy to 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 consume. And I, and I like that a lot. I like his style. Very, very interesting guy. Wow. I am I like for fun. Interesting. I'm for fun. And uh, his his whole thing is uh, fun is a serious business <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's quite interesting, but I, I, I think our viewers are going to kick out of that. Um, so who's next on your list there? Oh, gee, who do you Go got? Go ahead. You want, you want to do Steve? Should we do Steve? Uh, Steve. Yeah, MRE Steve. Okay, let's see. I believe it's right here. Okay, so... To kind of set the table, no pun intended here. Uh, <laughs> um, Steve is a phenomenal content creator. I found out about a, several years ago now. Basically, what Steve does is he orders military rations. I don't know where he gets these. I guess through maybe some website or maybe through like Amazon or eBay. I have no idea. But he'll get he'll get military rations of all shapes sizes and years now the military <laughs> ration that he actually is going to be opening up in this particular clip is from the 1940s <laughs> and this is what i love this is what i love about mre steve is that it's like it's almost like it's like science it's like science it's like a science project like he, yeah. when he's opening this stuff up from like the 1940s 1930s 1960s your curiosity goes through the roof. You're like, oh my God, what, what is this like? You know, what are these peaches, these canned peaches going to look like after 70 years? You're on the edge of your seat. He's really, really interesting just as a person as well. He really, mm -hmm. the way he presents the information, it's just this content right here. I'm telling you guys right now, this is, this is gold. This content is absolute gold. We're going to play a little clip and you'll, I am certain audience you will absolutely love emory steve go let's ahead take it away sir let's do it let's do it okay um i've seen a little bit of his stuff but not a whole lot i'm fascinated with what clip you actually came up with so this is cool let's get the sound to a tray nice okay let's first start off with that coffee i believe this is coffee so what we're looking at is a 1942 uh um what is it mre is that right that's correct yeah okay Okay. From um, 1942. Yeah, let's figure out how to wedge it up with this knife. It'll take you a minute to uh, open this thing. There we go. Would you look at that? I can't even believe it. That old coffee. <laughs> it smells very robust. Very interesting. <laughs> There's oh, something there you about go. it. What? Got the, got the he said the line! <laughs> Robust! <laughs> Robust! What is that? That is, um, it smells so nutty. Very nutty. <laughs> I gotta poke it with a fork. <laughs> oh, that is so satisfying. <laughs> Listen to that. Oh it's like poking a moon rock. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. We're gonna drop this into a mess cup. <laughs> And he does drink it, you guys. 1940s coffee, he does drink it. Oh, boy. Just dump the whole thing in there. Oh, gosh. Interesting <laughs> little tin. That's for sure. <laughs> and it looks like one of those charms candies liquefied a little bit on the top. That's what that was. <laughs> All right, let's check out the sugar cube. Oh, man. Sugar oh, that's cubes looking look pretty perfect. good. Yeah. Sweeten it with Domino. And we'll just do one cube. Oh no! Oh no! Oh god! Look at that. That coffee looks pretty good. <laughs> it does it though? Fantastic. So let's check out these biscuits. <laughs> Those have a little bit of a sketchy look to them. <laughs> like this one here. <laughs> yeah. Might not eat the one with the weird. I mean, that. I don't know what that is. Scrape it off, and I guess it's better, but why don't we try out one that's a little less oh, weird? No. Oh, no. That one there looks pretty good. Those are some wholesome-looking biscuits. 
I gotta try one of these out right now. Mm. That's perfectly fine. That's amazing. <laughs> no, that not. thing, that's a 75 year old biscuit. <laughs> and it's perfectly edible. Sorry for talking. Oh, well, I'm telling you, but, yeah, this, this is, is just, it's a. Uh, Oh, this guy, man, I could watch this guy's content all day long. I, I would get nothing done. I mean, it was <laughs> fascinating, fascinating stuff. I'm already Steve. I'm dying, man. I'm dying. Oh, this is this is a great stuff, man. This is some great stuff. That legitimately, um, it's awesome. That's great. Well, at least he has standards. At least he's like, ooh, that doesn't look so good. Let's go ahead yeah. and take a little <laughs> one, one on the bottom there. Hey. It just shows goes to show you guys. I mean, now in these kind of hard economic times, just because the expiration date has a date doesn't mean you necessarily have to follow it. There you go. There's some there you go. <laughs> what? No, and, no, uh, f folks, uh, definitely uh, <laughs> take precaution when you do that. Go ahead, OG. <laughs> well, I was going to say this guy. He, I mean, he regularly does this, like mm -hmm. stuff that's really, really old. He actually has a video. I'm not even kidding. Go to his channel. Obviously, I'm going to link it down below. He's got a video of a similar kind of cracker or biscuit, as he call calls calls mm -hmm. him in this video, similar mm -hmm. to that from the Civil War. <laughs> okay, from the Civil War, and he eats it. Wow! And he eats it. So wow, this guy wow. Steve has like the iron stomach. I don't know how he does this, Jesus. and he's still living. I have no idea. But man, I mean, he hats off to him. Mad respect because that's that's not easy. <laughs> So. Hey, uh, 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 mad respect indeed. This, this is uh, <laughs> that's that's pretty cool right there. Um, well, now I want to know how that coffee tastes. Does it taste you know? as robust as it looks? I don't know. We'll see. Uh, uh, you got to go there and watch uh, the video. Subscribe to the channel to figure it out. I, I love know. that. I love that. That is great. That's some great, great. stuff. It, it, uh, remarkable uh, <laughs> find there, OG. I love it. I love. It. I know you, you talked about this guy before. And, yeah. Uh, now, good. now, now I'm. Oh man, so subscribing after this show for sure. <laughs> uh, so I'll kick it back to theme parks just uh, uh, one last time. Sure. And um, but we're gonna go to the coaster enthusiast side. Coaster so okay. uh, the coaster enthusiasts on YouTube, first of all, they're insane. <laughs> uh, so, so is that all, the name of the channel? Just so I can. Um, uh, the name of the channel is El Toro Ryan. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Yep. Got him. All right. Um, the uh, the coaster enthusiast community on YouTube, like I said, they're insane. But second of all, they're uh, really kind of interesting because they kind of, you know, they're thrill junkies. But they have, you know, a lot of them have an analytical approach to, you know, all things thrill. And uh, El Toro Ryan is no ex exception. Uh, El Toro stands for the uh, um, uh, prefabricated intimate roller coaster over there in Six Flags uh, back east. I actually forget which park it is, but <laughs> um, it's been having some problems of its own. But but uh, uh, he took on the moniker El Toro Ryan because that's not only his you know, favorite attraction, but also he actually worked the attraction as a ride operator himself. So he kind of has some history with that attraction anyway uh this guy's uh thrill drunky for sure but but what was re really cool about his channel um he has his kind of videos where he'll visit a theme park and he kind of does it in a kind of a you know, hip cool way on the internet and what, whatever but his best videos i think are his problematic roller coaster series where he'll actually take a particular roller coaster and like break it down uh not only its history but you know its development its inception its execution its operations which I'm gonna I'm gonna play you a little bit of that right here because for oh. even for Disney folks you might not know how this uh, coaster that you're seeing right now this famous coaster being Big Thunder Mountain Railroad is actually run. He actually breaks it down how it runs, what its particular capabilities are, and so forth. I mean it's really kind of a fascinating thing. Um, and the reason it's called a problematic coaster series is he goes into the operations of it, and why it's kind of problematic to operate. So it's like why is the attraction down all the time? Well. A lot of times, it's for the reasons why he illustrates right here, um, and so it's 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 really kind of fun, man. I mean, cool. uh, now he he doesn't just do Disney uh, coasters, with, but he has done them, uh, Expedition Everest and Space Mountain, I think are his other ones. It might be another one in there, but um, he'll do uh, you know big roller coasters from Six Flags, Cedar Fair, and all that kind of stuff. Not Sperry Farm, um, uh, that's where he'll kind of specialize in. But uh, but his stuff on Disney. Is really really pretty cool. cool. Uh, he, he has an, he has an appreciation for those as well. So I'll go ahead and play this for you. Kind of gives you an idea of uh, of what he's all about. 
When running all five trains, there must be at least three trains in motion at the same time. Oftentimes, four trains are in motion and sometimes even all five trains are in motion at the same time. To make this possible, the ride has a very unique block system that allows for lots of simultaneous motion. For those of you who are unfamiliar, a block zone is a section of a ride that only one train may occupy at a time. At the end of a block zone is a method to stop a train from proceeding into the next block if that block is occupied. This is the safety system that prevents roller coaster trains from colliding with each other. Now in any roller coaster, you need one additional block zone for how many trains are on the track. So to run three trains, there need to be at least four block zones, so that an empty block is available for trains to begin motion with. Hmm. Now Big Thunder Mountain technically has five block zones for five trains, but thanks to the dual loading station and a rather bizarre block system, motion is still possible. Let me demonstrate by showing the block zones. I've go. color coordinated the block sections to label them. The station is the red track and is labeled in red. The blue track is block zone 1 and is labeled in blue. The orange track is block zone 2 and is labeled in orange. The pink track is block zone 3 and is labeled in pink. And the aqua track is block zone 4 and is labeled in aqua. Altogether, this equates to 5 blocks. Now Big Thunder Mountain isn't like an ordinary roller coaster where only one train can occupy each block zone. So what I said earlier about block zones with only one train being able to occupy a block zone, that applies to probably 99.99% of roller coasters. Big Thunder Mountain does things very differently and actually allows two trains to occupy the same block zone, but only in certain block zones and only if the forward train in the block zone stays in motion. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at the blue track or block zone one. So he breaks that down oh. here and, and goes into it with uh, with quite a bit of analysis. And it's it's fascinating. It's like you ride this all the time and it's like you never really think about how it's actually run. But yeah. um, when you see enough videos like this, uh, you'll start to really appreciate what those ride operators will do, how fast those loading times are, those dispatch times are and what they're actually doing to actually conduct this kind of orchestra on the pl on the on wow. the load and unload platform, so to speak. It's really kind of fascinating. He also brings up this part, which I just remembered. See if I can go ahead and bring this up, but yeah. OG, you, you like you liking this so far? Yeah, this is fascinating. You know, it, it, like you said, the ride operators are really the unsung heroes. You know, and it's 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 like you said, it's this orchestra that they kind of have to, to kind of have to balance and everything. It's pretty awesome, dude. And, and as fans, as, as theme park goers, right, we kind of take um, take it for granted. There's mm -hmm. a lot that goes on behind the scenes that we're not aware of. We, 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 we see everything running smoothly and what have you, and we think it's easy. It, it's not necessarily so easy. There's a lot of engineering and, and all kinds of stuff that goes behind the, the, these attractions. It's, it's, it's very complex in the, the block zone thing and fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Oh. It absolutely is. And you're right about the, there's a lot of things that we don't necessarily see behind the scenes. Uh, this illustrates that perfectly. So I'll play this little section here if I get it right. Ride areas and are highly visible. Disney being here different from guest bar. At your typical amusement park, the storage areas for ride vehicles are not hidden from guest view. They are typically right in the ride areas and are highly visible. Disney being Disney do not like to do this and hide their storage areas from guests so that they do not intrude on the aesthetic of a ride. Here we have the location of Big Thunder Mountain at Walt Disney World. And way over here across the Walt Disney World railroad train tracks is the storage shed for Big Thunder. Hmm. There are two bizarre obstacles that trains must maneuver to travel to and from the storage area. They must travel over a bridge that swings across the train tracks and also up and down a mini lift hill leading into the storage shed. This is far more complicated than your traditional transfer track that simply swings into position. Hmm. Transferring on and off trains at Big Thunder Mountain at Disney World is like a puzzle. For one, in order to use the swing bridge that goes over the train tracks, Big Thunder Mountain's ride crew has to coordinate with the Walt Disney World Railroad crew. What? On the railroad, a train will need to be stopped at the Frontierland station and the Big Thunder crew will need to exchange hand signals with the train crew. Only then can the swing bridge be swung into place to allow the ride vehicles to travel over the train tracks. Besides the mini lift hill, trains are advanced through this entire area using LIMs. Trains are transferred onto the spur Maybe side of the motors. station which is the station platform on the right when descending down the ramp into the station. The platform on the left is called Main. The section of track leading to the swing bridge and mini lift hill is called the spur track. Thankfully, the spur track can hold two trains. So if Big Thunder is only operating three trains and needs to increase to five train operations, two trains will be ready to go, and the complicated process of bringing a train all the way from the storage shed across the railroad won't be necessary. Whoa. So if you thought it was cool watching ride crews at your local Six Flags or Cedar Fair Park transferring on or off trains, the process at Big Thunder Mountain at Walt Disney World is far more complicated. 
Isn't that insane? That's like, awesome. Really that, awesome. That's cool. So yeah. if you want to go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Well, no, I was just going to say the way this gentleman, this El Toro Ryan, the way he presents the information, right? Mm -hmm. The way he talks, the way he presents it, mm -hmm. really, 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 really A+. plus. Um, yeah. the, he kind of has that, I know it sounds kind of kind of cheesy or whatever, but he kind of has like that very like, um, like, like if you watch something like on Travel Channel, right? Yeah. Or something like that, you know, the, the people that narrate this stuff. Yes. He, he's, he has that kind of energy to him. It's very, very clean, professional, well-written. I don't know, really, really high quality. I, I, I really like, I really like what he offers here. I, I had no, I, this is my first time seeing him. I will definitely subscribe. Oh, no, he's, he's, he's really, really cool. And even if you're not a fan of like big coasters like this, it is just fascinating to see That's how neat. they work, you know, see what makes them tick. And Hey, when you're going on an attraction at Disney, a lot of those same elements and that same philosophy, that mindset, that the operational realities come into play with your favorite attractions. And so it's like, oh, okay, yeah. it's like, okay, I kind of know how this is working right here. Yeah. It's really, really cool for an operations junkie like me. I mean, this is a this is a must have. This is a must subscribe. Um, and if you want to learn more stories about like how Disney does things as opposed to other uh, uh, theme park operators, well, there are many more stories like that embedded in this problematic roller coaster series. So awesome. definitely check them out for sure. Very uh, cool stuff. Very, very cool stuff. Fascinating. Now you have uh, uh, another gentleman here, which I oh, do. Like, I do. We got one one more to go on my side. Cool. Right here. Okay. So <laughs> this <laughs> gentleman, I've been following, I've been subscribed to that junk man for a very long time, many, many years. Mm. Now to get to give you all kind of a little background on him, he is a huge Star Wars person. His content really does center around Star Wars. Yes. But not in the way that people would think when people mm -hmm. think star Wars content, they think, okay, he's going to be doing videos on like, you know, the history of Ahsoka Tano and things like that, or, or, uh, you know, let's, let's break down Darth Maul's lightsaber, real nerdy in the weeds kind of stuff. Right. That's not what that junk man does. Mm -hmm. That junk man focuses on star Wars, but the toys around star Wars, that's why he's called that junk man. You can see on his wall behind him, he's got all kinds of toys, Indiana Jones, the Pac-Man arcade, Really, really cool stuff. So his whole channel is really centered around that toy collecting culture. Now, mm -hmm. not to say he doesn't give his opinion on like things like Andor or the Book of Boba or Mandalorian. He absolutely does. But the, yeah. the whole thing, the whole niche that he does really primarily is in that toy world. And wow. um, very, very 80s, 1980s centric. So if you're a fan of the 80s, you're going to love that junk, man. And another thing wow. I really like about this guy is he's very kind of um, – he's like – best way to like kind of describe his style, ragtag. He's very ragtag. The way he, he kind of does his videos and everything, it's very ragtag. It's not like a very clean, polished thing. It, it's very much like he's in his junk – like in his junk room in, his, in, in like a basement somewhere with toys and kind of filming this. It has like kind of like that very amateur – kind of aesthetic but it's so well done so this video to kind of set the table a little bit kind of showcases that the creativity and Im immense creativity the humor uh that he brings in this really encapsulates i think that junk man perfectly and it's and it's less than a minute so go ahead take it away mr junk man i love it i love it i, I love the guys who 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 break down the merch cuz let's be honest here folks these big companies and corporations and stuff like that when they pitch ip it's all about the merch so i love it i love it let's see let's do it oh it's not the worst but i really enjoying it larry what do you think you enjoying that boba fett show and it's okay i'm enjoying it but there are some problems with it what was with those scooters with those bright colors oh give me a break and come on like can we talk about boba fett you know what i like to call him Boba Fat. <laughs> Get it? Boba Fat. <laughs> you know, because he's gained weight. He's fat now. He's gained, he's gained a little weight. Gained a little weight. Took the word Boba Fat and I changed the E to an A. <laughs> Boba. Boba Fat. 
Okay, this next one's not really Star Wars or even movie. Or- <laughs> <laughs> and that's just a little, little taste of that junk man. He's really, really funny. He does a lot of creative skits like that. And I think it was really clever how he incorporates mm-hmm. the toys in his stick. L- Larry the Wampa, who you saw, is mm-hmm. just one character that he brings out. He's mm-hmm. got... um. I think he's a gangster Chewbacca, a little mm-hmm. stuffed animal Chewy with a hat. Hilarious. Mm-hmm. He's got a woke Wookiee. He's got mm-hmm. all kinds of characters, and they all have different voices. Very well done. But you can kind of see how he has that kind of scrappy ragtag style. Mm-hmm. Um, very, very uh, entertaining, to say the least. And the thing about that junk man is he doesn't really care. He'll offend everybody. He's an equal opportunity offender he will offend the left the right and everyone in between he doesn't care if he's anything like his twitter presence (laughs) which is also uh let's say uh spicy um oh yeah you should have a good time here (laughs) but just understand folks you 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 might say some things that might um uh um let's say incite a, a reaction or two yeah, no, hundred percent, hundred percent. And if you're and if you're of that generation that you know grew up in the '80s, you're gonna, actually going to love his content because, like I said, he he is very focused on that era yeah. of toys. And he'll bring up he'll have videos on toys that like I haven't seen or thought about for literally decades. And I'm like, oh my god, I remember that. You know, like Stretch Armstrong and all this other stuff. And he'll do a whole video on that. And I'm like, that's fascinating. So it's not just funny skits like this. It's even like very um, kind of educational and, and informative with a lot of a, a lot of like the the um, you know the, his content. You know, in regards to like vintage toy collecting and all that. So phenomenal content creator. Definitely give him a subscribe. That junk man. Fantastic. I love it. I love it. Um, well, if you like that, OG, we're going to have some fun here. Um, <laughs> this is going to be kind of different. Uh, okay. We're going to do this in a different way. Okay, so to start off, let's see. Let's see if I can bring Who, who are we doing so I can give credit? Uh, we're going to do the Internet Historian. And right. do I even have him up? Let me see. Oh, I might not. Okay, so that's okay. Um, oh no, I do, I do. Oh, you do, yeah. Okay, I do. Yes, yeah, so, sorry, right. I've lost him. Okay, all right. So, okay, the internet historian is very interesting. Um, <laughs> he started out as a channel that would go through like notable events in internet history, right? Internet historian. And he would kind of break them down as kind of in this kind of uh, <laughs> kind of in this kind of unique style. And you'll see that illustrated here. He has kind of evolved over time a little bit and, and gotten better at it. But he has a style where you know um, him. I say him, but it's really kind of a team now, where they will take like stock imagery, right, on like uh, like all over the internet and like create or recreate a story or event or whatever. And it's it's really well done, really, really awesome. Um, but, you know, he'll take, like, uh, the Costa Concordia, for example, right? The member of that famous cruise ship that kind of, like, um, uh, I think it was on the, uh, oh, what is it? It was on the perimeter of, like, uh, the coast of Italy, if I'm not mistaken. And right. it kind of, like, it, it kind of uh, capsized and, and, and you know, uh, um, it was stuck. <laughs> like, half mm-hmm. of it was in the water for, for a period of time, right? You, we all kind of remember that story. He'll break that down using this method, and it is unbelievably engaging. It is phenomenal. Um, wow. But, uh, but, he, but, like, but like I said, he would start out with, like, you know, uh, events in internet history, but now he's kind of taking that and doing, like, a historian, but on the internet, <laughs> you know? So he'll take, <laughs> like, other events throughout time. This event took place in 1925 so that's kind of the range of what we're talking about here however for og i og i know you have some claustrophobia oh (laughs) okay um you will face your fears right now (laughs) okay uh this might make i have not shown Oh, gee, this for a reason, because I wanted to get the audience's reaction to this, because (laughs) you're going to see it's going to make you uncomfortable, Wow! but try to endure it. 
Okay. Oh, just, absolutely. Okay. All right. All right. Here we go. Oh. Uh, give you the first uh, five minutes of this, just to kind of get you enticed. If you want to see the rest, I mean, it's like an it's like an hour. But uh, if you want to see the rest, go, definitely subscribe to Inner Story and see it. It's awesome. I think this video has like two, three million views in the first day. I mean, it's <laughs> it's pretty big. But some some people, you know, still haven't seen them. So uh, I share this with you. Here we go. Um, <laughs> it's gonna be interesting. I'm telling you, this is going to be interesting. Here we go. In the state of Kentucky, there is a cave that every now and then demands a sacrifice. January 30th, 1925. A man walks towards the cave with a kerosene lamp in his hand. He hangs up his jacket and ducks into a five-foot opening. The inside of the cave is narrow. He has to drop down on his hands and knees, crawling through a passageway filled with jagged rocks and choking dust. Then down a chute he had cleared out months earlier. All of the daylight is gone from here, and this lantern is his only source of light. Ignoring the loose limestone rocks perched directly above him, he is now 100 feet in. And here he reaches the turnaround room. Now they call this the turnaround room because this is the juncture where even experienced cavers say, no thanks, and turn around. Because to continue on means going through this, the squeeze. A gap in the stone of only nine inches. For reference, he has a subway sub. <laughs> oh. Going through, he would look exactly like this. His arms will need to be completely at their side, and he will need to exhale so that he can reduce the size of his torso. Gradually, bit by bit, he disappears into the hole. His clothes are caught on sharp gypsum crystals hooking into him and threatening to hold him in place. But using his feet like paddles, he pushes through. He reaches a wider opening at the other side, then crawls forward towards a ledge. Illuminated here is a ten-foot drop. A rope is already secured around a boulder, which allows him to rappel down. His worn-out leather shoes touch the ground. This is as far as he can go, and it is time for work to begin. What he is working on is another opening. At the moment, it's too small for anyone to fit through, but he will chip away at it until he can shove himself right through the other side. Because on the other side is this. A magnificent and otherworldly cave structure that will be irresistible to tourists. Every day for months, he has been removing rocks from this crevice. To him, this is all just routine. Mm. So he eases further into the gap. Carefully, he contorts his body through. Rocks compress the sides of his torso, so close that his arms are pinned to the side of his body. He once again paddles his feet to inch down. Then, about halfway, he stops. Hmm. The lantern, it's starting to dim. He will need to go all the way back to the surface to refuel the thing. He sighs. He slowly shuffles back out, pushing the lantern with his shoulder. Then, oh no, ding, crack, darkness. He has knocked over the lamp and it has broken. Now the man didn't panic. He had been caught in the dark before, and he could make his way back by feel alone. So he continues worming out, leveraging his foot against what he thinks is the cave wall. But that is not the cave wall. That is in fact a rock protruding from the ceiling. As soon as he puts his weight against the rock, it breaks loose. A solid piece weighing 15 kilograms lands directly on his ankle. It aches, but he's okay. It doesn't feel as though his ankle is broken, just badly bruised and caught underneath the rock. So he shuffles to move the rock away, 
Suddenly, gravel. A lot of gravel. It falls onto his feet, his legs, his torso, and the weight of it all forces the wedged rock deeper into the gap underneath his foot. Pinned. He tries to push forward. He cannot. He tries to inch backwards. He cannot. He is stuck. This is Sand Cave. This man is Floyd Collins. He is trapped in absolute darkness. 60 feet deep below the earth. All of his limbs held in place at the very bottom of this. Wow. That's insane. So, That's insane. That is the start of that video. What happens when you're stuck in the middle of a cave? Which, by the way, you as a cave diver are probably the best in the world. Yeah. And you, you're one of the only ones that can get to you oh, in God. 1925. Oh there my go. God. That's, That's awesome. I will definitely be subscribing to him. That's yeah. fascinating. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. I, I, it always boggles my mind as a claustrophobic person. When I see people inserting themselves into situations like that, oh my god, oh my god, that is he, wild. He has some fun ones, honestly, and he'll do it. He'll do it in a very fun way, as you kind of saw there. He kind of brought it down a little bit in order to emphasize the tension, obviously. But he'll right, do right. stuff like that. Like I said, the Costa Concordia, Area Fifty One, <laughs> um, wow. the time of the. Uh, as he calls it, the virus, where, uh, you know, what what the world was kind of going through and the rush yeah. for toilet paper and stuff like that. and Just a really uh, phenomenal stuff, really kind of fun stuff. Fry Festival, he has one on that. And, cool. Um, you will absolutely love this channel, guys. I, I, I promise you he does it with such humor and such fun. Uh, and, and you will be enthralled by whatever topic he, 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 uh, he picks. In this case... Um, well, you're going to have to go there and find out, but yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a wild ride for sure. I'll definitely subscribe. That's a good mm -hmm. one. That's a great one. Great yeah. one. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good stuff. All right. Um, now, uh, I think, uh, we, were you complete yeah, in your, well, I'm complete. I think you have two more. Yeah. I, uh, well, I, it's really just one more, but okay. it's, uh, it's kind of weird how it works. So, okay. I am a big fan of a gentleman. Let's see if uh, I can find it here. Yes. Okay. I'm a big fan of both these gentlemen, but a particular fan of the one on the right, and that is Robert Barnes. Now, now real um, quick, um, did I get the credit right? This you is, did, you did. This is okay, Viva Fry's sure. channel, and the reason Perfect. why we're highlighting you know, Viva Fry is that Robert Barnes doesn't really have a YouTube channel of his own. He goes on other YouTube channels, and I'll kind of describe that whole thing as we go along here. But Robert Barnes is a particularly fascinating gentleman. He's not only a, 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 a quite the attorney. I mean, he was the lead attorney, I think, in the Wesley Snipes case. If if ever people remember that back when he had his kind of tax problems, he was yeah. he ran lead attorney on that. Uh, his most recent case actually is this kind of Amish farmer case going on and. Uh, uh, Pennsylvania, which uh, if, for those of you who are unfamiliar, the government is actually going after this uh, Amish, uh, uh, this, this Amish f farmer essentially, and uh, he's attempting to kind of, um, you know, sell food using organic methods and ones that don't necessarily conform to the FDA. And it's it's a very uh, it's a very interesting story. It, it, it really is. But he's the lead attorney on that case. <laughs> Uh, wow. You know, re representing that, that gentleman just recently, actually, uh, he had some other um, attorneys before didn't go, quite go so well. So he's like, uh, he's, he's gone on uh, uh, representing him. But uh, he's brought probably more cases to the Supreme Court in probably the last 30 years than just about any other attorney. OK, so this guy is, is pretty big in the legal world. 
But then he's also been a campaign and political advisor. He has managed and run campaigns before for both uh, parties, actually, for both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, uh, candidates from you know, you know, local jurisdictions and so forth. He's also been an advisor to presidents. <laughs> he's been a uh, political, uh, senior political analysis uh, analyst for uh, a, a number of different, uh, a, a number of different both campaigns and and both uh, administrations and so forth. So he's got that going for him. He's also a notable sports better <laughs> and uh, political gambler essentially. So he actually bet big on uh, some of the, these most recent elections and actually won some big money uh, by, by doing that. Uh, he's kind of a pseudo pollster in that way. And he does team up with an actual poster who we'll get to in a moment, but you know, he's got that going for him. He's like I said, sports better. And, and the, the, the reason why that's notable is, is because, if you're sports gambling, right? Think about it. You got to be able to have some predictive qualities or else you're going right. to be out of a lot of money. And so what metrics would you use to do that? What kind of analysis or what kind of indicators would you include in your analysis in order to give you or provide you kind of an edge on your opponents? Uh, that would kind of over time would hone your skills into – uh, not just uh, you know what to be following, but who to be following, where right. you can glean analysis from, and so forth. So he's applied that methodology to the you know every single other portion of his life. Like I said, he is a fascinating, fascinating individual. And if you've been listening to Robert Barnes enough, you it's weird because you kind of pseudo predict the future in a way because you use a lot of his. Uh, analytical uh, analytical approach to certain things using his methodology and you'll kind of get like oh okay I kind of know how this is going to go how this is going to work but uh, you know even if you can't figure it out yourself he will obviously provide in insight and commentary into all things and and this goes from the political realm to the sports realm to the media realm to the legal realm and whatever and to give you kind of an idea of his legal analysis I wanted to go ahead and include this clip here it's a couple months old uh, by the way, so it's it's a little bit outdated, obviously. Uh, as a result, legal cases they take time to develop, but they also they do develop, and some things change. However, I wanted to I, I wanted to highlight this clip because I think it it does provide some perspective on on, on him and what he does. Uh, to give viewers some context and backstory into this, uh, Elon Musk and we we talked about it on this show before. Yeah. Elon Musk attempted to buy Twitter. Well, what happened with that? Well, it kind of broke down. Apparently, uh, Elon Musk found that uh, Twitter was, you know, I mean, the allegation anyway he's positing in court is that it is littered with bots. It is littered with fake accounts, which when you think about it would hurt your valuation because your valuation is basically how many eyeballs are looking at your content, right? Right. Um, and if that metric is any at, at all skewed, or if you have been kind of cooking the books, well, that would really hurt or or hinder or alter that valuation and that purchase price. So that's kind of the claim that Elon Musk is making. He's saying, look, listen, this isn't the company that necessarily I got into. But to kind of provide some a little bit of backstory to that, well, here was Robert Barnes' analysis on on uh, on, um, on another. Uh, YouTube channel that he frequents quite regularly, Viva Fry. They go on and they break down legal cases and so forth all across the United States for about two hours every single Sunday. It's a great cool. show, but here's just a little clip just to give you a little taste of him and the show itself. Cool. If you look at uh, uh, what you dig into it and the, the meat of the suit, I think Musk has a stronger claim. His claim is we shouldn't go to trial in, in October. We should go to trial in February. That's before the drop dead closing financing date of April. Number one. Number two, this is a discovery intensive case because we want to figure out what's happening because it turned out that Twitter's only way of measuring bots was to have somebody look at 100 accounts a day. And that was it. There was no sophistication to it whatsoever. No statistical sampling of any substance. No AI algorithmic. And they have tons of algori algorithms at Twitter. But they don't have any for measuring bots. Mm. Don't have any for measuring spam. Mm. And there's really only one reason that would be. And it's probably the real reason Twitter sued. Because they're littered with bots and spam. Because yeah. the whole value of Twitter is mm -hmm. based on their real-time individual users. And if a lot of their... Because that's how they sell their advertising. If it turns out 
20%, 25%, maybe even half in some cases are bots or not real individual human beings, then their value di just disappears. This is a problem for big tech across the board because they've likely been lying in their advertising model on Facebook, on YouTube, on through Google about how many eyeballs are actually reading the advertisement because they're saying that every they want the bot accounts because the bot accounts get to inflate their advertising dollars. And that's why Twitter, uh, when Musk found out, they don't care about the bot problem because the bot problem isn't a problem for Twitter because Twitter makes money off of all their bots. It's exposing the fact that their bots is a problem for Twitter. And Musk is demanding that be the deep dive. He also made a good argument. He says, look, they're claiming uh, that uh, I did a bunch of breaches. Well, that's a whole new ground of discovery. We're not going to be able to get that in six weeks. So by their own claims, we need a trial in February. And what he wants is he wants a deep dive into what the scale and scope of the bot problem is at Twitter, expert testimony, analytics, et cetera, because Twitter clearly has a big bot problem. And it could mean the end of Twitter. It wow. could. It could. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, there's some interesting stuff there. Now, I think in this lawsuit, I believe the, uh, you know, Obviously, Musk files a motion for the case to be uh, for a continuance, I believe, in February. That motion's denied. I think it's going to go forward in October, so it's going to be kind of interesting to see how that kind of plays out there. But if you want to keep a, uh, you know, track of that case, this is the group <laughs> to do so, absolutely for sure. And it's interesting because we, uh, we have heard recently that Bob Iger himself... When he was, you know, kicking the tires around Twitter and really kind of seeing whether or not he was going to actually purchase the company uh, as part of Disney, he raised a similar issue. He said, yeah, we looked into it. And yeah, they do have a bot problem. And that was kind of one of the reasons why we kind of backed up on it. Well, that's interesting, Bob. I hear you really didn't go public with that information. It, it certainly would have been something that, uh, yeah. you know, investors would have liked to have known. That's a whole nother story. It's 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 quite a fascinating kind of interesting story, but um, you know, to to get an insight of not just that story, but but many others throughout uh, both the legal and political landscape. <laughs> it's a guy right here. I mean, it's 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 quite fascinating. Obviously, there's a little bit of a you know, there's a bias, just like anybody else, but uh, kind of a real fair in depth analysis. You can't go wrong with uh, Robert Barnes. Well, it's interesting about the Twitter bot thing. It's kind of like if you were to put it like in terms of like a, a YouTube analogy, right? Yeah. Let's say a content creator has, I don't know, 50,000 subscribers, right? Mm -hmm. it, the number is 50,000. Yes. And they're approached by a sponsor, right? Yeah. Well, as a sponsor, as someone who's going to give that content creator money to promote their product, mm -hmm. You want to, as that sponsor, right? You, you want to know that it's 50,000 real people. But if it turns out, yeah, it's 50,000 subscribers, but I don't know, 25% of those are dead accounts that are no longer in use, fake accounts, yada, 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 bots, whatever. Well, that lowers the value of that YouTube channel. It's no longer 50,000 subs. Now Correct. it's, you know, 35. You know, or something, yep. and that makes a difference in that channel's valuation. Absolutely. So that's why it's so important with Twitter. I know a lot of people might on 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 a surface level kind of go, "Well, who cares how many bots there are?" Well, it makes all the difference because if you're not actually reaching that amount of people that Twitter is claiming that they're reaching, well, mm -hmm. then it's not as big of a platform as they're claiming, and that's going to lower the value big time. So it's a huge thing. It's still going on in court. Crazy stuff. It is, it is, and like I said, uh, this, these guys, these guys will update you for sure. But Robert Barnes, like I said, he doesn't have really a, uh, a channel of his own. He'll go on other channels and provide his analysis and commentary based on any topics that they would like to discuss. Cool. Um, he goes on uh, America's Untold Stories, which you know, uh, on their kind of freeform Friday uh, type show that they have on that channel, and uh, he'll be there with Mark Robert and Eric Hundley, who will go over you know stuff like I don't know like the um, Kennedy assassination, let's say, right? And, and kind of, you know, break down, hmm, you know, there, there's some interesting stuff here, interesting stuff there, right? And he'll kind of put it through his uh, his analysis on that as well. He'll also go through the ge geopolitical uh, realm with uh, the Duran on YouTube, who will, uh, you know, they'll, they'll break down, you know, I mean, 
I don't know, you got a lot of stuff going on with um, Eastern Europe right now, as you might imagine. You know, what what kind of insight or analysis can we glean from that? He'll go on that show and kind of break down those, those uh, pivotal races, maybe in Sweden and Italy and so forth. Maybe what's going on between, uh, you know, countries like Russia and Ukraine or maybe how it relates to Germany and so forth. It's really kind of interesting stuff, really kind of broaden your kind of perspective on, on those stories. And uh, I like to highlight contrarian uh, kind of independent uh, creators and <laughs> Robert Barnes will definitely come at it from kind of a contrarian perspective but one that's based in fact and mostly facts that maybe people aren't discussing or aren't talking about or aren't including in their analysis and so forth which brings us to another channel that he'll frequent himself on which is the People's Pundit and the People's Pundit <laughs> look uh, Richard Barris is probably the single best pollster Probably ever, <laughs> probably, probably yeah. that we know of. I mean, he uh, some races that were like, OK, um, nobody had this go in this direction. He has accurately predicted within a margin of like one or two percent. I mean, he is spot wow. on in his analysis. It's insane. Um, and uh, right now, obviously, it's election season. So uh, they're going to be meeting, I think, every Tuesday night and going over uh, some of the polling that Richard Barris and his firm uh, with the people's spot and so forth are doing and are, are, you know, they're going into the key battleground states, obviously, and all the kind of pivotal elections, all the House seats, Senate seats, gubernatorial races and so forth, and really kind of break them down, uh, utilizing uh, his polling that he'll be doing, but also the voter files that he has access to. And it's just it is fascinating, fascinating stuff, honestly. And to give you just a little idea of what uh, Barnes can do in this realm, I play you this clip here. All right. Well, you know? it relates to the, the broader trends. One of the two of the trends I like to follow are the voter registrations and uh, th three, I should say, voter registration, primary participation, primary vote share, yeah, and political affiliation. All in these key states are trending heavily Republican. That yeah. the the uh, the party uh, in terms of voter yes, registration, sir. as Richard just went through, Pennsylvania, uh, uh, North Carolina, Florida, Arizona, all the states where we have party registration, not all states do, overwhelmingly trend Republican. And if you do a, a, a deeper dive into it, it's two main co uh, constituencies. Working class whites continue to increasingly shift their partisan affiliation, particularly ancestrally Democratic working class white groups are shifting into uh, Republican registration. The second, though, Equally important that the media occasionally sporadically talks about, but then conveniently forgets because it goes so much against their general narrative. Yes. Is the continued shift amongst Latinos, amongst uh, Mexican Americans, Puerto Ricans, Venezuelans, Cubans. This group continues to trend massively Republican by like 20, 30 points kind of shift. Uh, and that's what's all of a sudden making Texas no longer competitive from a Democratic perspective. Where's all the Beto hype this time around, right? There, there's, there's none of it. They know he's going to get crushed. Uh, the same in, yeah, yeah. and that's what makes Nevada and Arizona different. Mm. Nevada and Arizona were states that were trending Democratic because of the Mexican-American vote. That vote is now shifting dramatically Republican in trend. I mean, it'll still be net Democratic, but not the kind of margins they have to get to offset the losses in other groups in the state. And in Nevada, the hardest group to poll are Asian voters. It's always tricky to get them. But the better way to track is to track independent voters. And in fact, independent voters have often gone 20 plus points for one side or the other when there's been a big swing in the state. That's the nature of the independent voter here. Mm. So it's a work. There's a low representation of college upper middle class whites in, in Nevada. So they depend on it, Latinos and, and they depend on the independent vote amongst Latinos and Asians, mm. Filipinos in particular. We have certain Asian groups here. Those are groups under Obama were trending very Democratic under Trump. They trended the opposite direction. Mm. Um, and now, of course, also in Nevada, black so yeah um that's, that's kind of what's going on there and that's why look i understand it's the kind of political realm right and then you know we do not necessarily a political channel by any stretch and i kind of stay out of that for obvious reasons however it's important to kind of know what's going on in the country what's Absolutely. going on especially as we get more polarized especially as it becomes more partisan it's kind of important to know because you can judge a lot of stuff based on polling based on 
uh, what people value, right? Like, what what are the key issues for them, right? Um, you know, I mean, look, that, the perfect example is probably uh, Disney in Florida. Had Disney tracked what was going on in Florida, they probably could have uh, avoided completely risking the RCID at all. Now, again, well, we have said before that, um, you know, that it won't be done away with entirely, but it would have never been up for discussion at all had they tracked the kind of voter and consumer and demographics and all that kind of stuff going on in Florida. So it's kind of like, it's important. It's important to kind of, you know, take an honest look at some of these things, um, not just from the political perspective, which is obviously going to affect all our lives as, you know, certain people, you know, uh, you know, gains, gain the reins of power and so forth. But, but also too, just to kind of know what your neighbor's thinking, what the city across from you is thinking, what the town is thinking, because that it's going to, it's going to affect you and it's going to affect consumer trends as we talk about the theme park space, or I should say media landscape as well. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, if, if the country is leaning more left, then companies like Disney are, are going to pander more towards that affiliation. If, if the country mm -hmm. is starting to lean more right, um, you know, they're, they're, companies like Disney are going to lean more towards that affiliation. Look, a guy like Bob Chapek is all about the money. He doesn't yes. really care one way or the other, left or right. But if he thinks that, like, you know, um, if he thinks going too far to the left is going to hurt his money, like it, like it, like it is potentially going to do with Reedy Creek, then that's going to shift how he kind of governs Disney. So that's why the political stuff is so important. You know, where the country's going, the overall kind of temperature in the room, it makes a big difference at Disney, a huge difference at Disney, you know? So it, it's, it, you don't have to be a political junkie per se, but it's always good to kind of keep your ear, your, your ear to the ground with this stuff because it does absolutely affect Disney. It absolutely does. You know, these companies like Disney, you know, they're, they're, they, they have a lot of dealings with like local governments and what have you. So they're going to kiss all the right asses and it's going to be left or right. They don't give a shit. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it, it's very important who's in power at the time, where the direction is going uh, as to what Disney does. So yeah, fascinating exactly. Stuff. Fascinating stuff. Absolutely. And you saw Barnes kind of break down the demographics as it related to like Nevada or Arizona, for for instance. But what if you take a state like Wisconsin, like Wisconsin, you know, uh, people kind of have an idea of what that state's all about in their heads. But what if it's like super rural? What if it's kind of hard to pull? What if it's, you know, made up of like the Danish and the Swedish and the and the and the Italians? And how would that kind of adjust, you know, the the uh consumer patterns in that area how would that you know how would their values differ from one another those those kind of key those key groups there it's like you know barnes will take that and and just i mean i heard analysis he did on arizona and it was like whoa like i don't even know if he's been to the state but he knows it to a t <laughs> i mean it was kind of yeah. crazy and i've lived here in my life and there were some things that he brought out that i didn't even know and some things it was like yep that's exactly how it is you know wow. so what's um Barnes is, a, Barnes is a very interesting individual. Like I said, he frequents channels like, you know, Favorite Fry, The Duran, People's Pundit, uh, America's Untold Stories. He has his own kind of thing going on there at the locals with Viva Barnes Viva Barnes Law uh, So he's 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 all over the shop. But if you listen to him enough, again, it's kind of scary how much you'll you'll be able to see what's coming and 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 you know, uh, the, the landscape on, on a many different, a variety of issue, uh, not just political, but like, like Twitter, for instance, you know, how much yeah. real kind of commentary have you gotten on that issue? Well, you just heard a little bit right there. So it's, it's fascinating stuff for sure. No, it is. It's, a, it, it's absolutely fascinating. And one of the things that I think people kind of make the mistake doing is they, they look at a guy like Barnes, maybe, right. Mm -hmm. They look at a guy yeah. like Robert Barnes and they go, Oh, yeah, he's a Republican or they, they kind of like dismiss somebody because of a political affiliation or or maybe someone is looking at a de like a, a person who is maybe far, far left and go, ah, mm -hmm. they're a lefty. I'm not going to, you know, when it comes to content, you really want to you really want to listen to all sides. Yes. I mean, you don't have to necessarily agree with the opinions that that person is saying, mm -hmm. but to be a well-informed um well-rounded individual intellectually you're going to want to see all perspectives right um you're not you don't want to just have like a one track kind of thing look on this channel I, I i disagree with a lot 
of 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 opinions in between even me and Dre. We don't agree on everything, but I have a lot of um, we have a lot of like uh, contributors that come on who have vastly different perspectives. You know, I'm I'm honestly to be quite real, I enjoy Universal, but I'm not a Universal guy. My mm -hmm. heart, my love, my passion is with the Walt Disney Company. I enjoy Universal, but my heart and passion is with Walt Disney Company. Well, that's why I like to bring on. A guy like you know theme park wizard because he has that passion that fire that spark for universal yeah so it's like i don't agree with wizard on everything i'm not there mm -hmm. with the universal love like he is and that's exactly why the fuck i bring him on because he is not the same i don't want a whole panel full of ogs you know i want yeah. i want people with different viewpoints so when you when you look at a guy like robert barnes don't necessarily blow him off just because i'm republican uh eh. Come on, give the guy a chance. Smart um, perspective, smart analysis. You know, it doesn't hurt to at least give it a shot. That's all I'm saying, and that goes for the opposite end of the spectrum too. If you're a if you're a Republican and, and you're looking at content, just because someone's a lefty, don't blow them off. Yeah, no, hundred percent, hundred percent. It's it if if they're a really good independent source on information or if they have really kind of articulate opinion that that is consistent with the, the world around them even if it's through view to that lens there's so much to glean from that there's so much to gain from that so right like i said to you og it's like it, it, it or like you've you've actually said <laughs> um don't don't write these guys off it, no. it really you know you really have to you know broaden out you know you don't want to create a a group think you don't want to create this kind of uh, insular bubble for yourself no. branch out it's good trust me and you don't have to agree with everything but no. at least uh, you can at least you know even if you do disagree like if they're on the completely different aisle of the political spectrum that, than you are at right yeah you know maybe it gives you insight into why they believe the the, the things they do maybe it gives you insight into uh into a, a way of looking at things that you 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 yourself never looked at before right you know and, and like i said like a uh, universal perfect instance <laughs> that's not right and left that's um mickey uh, it's a that's a mouse globe i think it's, <laughs> it's right. kind of the, <laughs> the, the the dynamic going there right or, or, or mouse minion yeah exactly we talked about the people mover at the very front of this video hey yeah. how, what you know what what could they do to replace the people mover well if you weren't at all a universal guy maybe you don't know that there is a right. you know kind of an attraction in dr Seuss. it's very similar to the people mover that that disney could adapt themselves and 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 you know replace the track with what well, you would you would have never known had you just stayed within the disney bubble let's yep. say right it's good to kind of branch out because guess what Disney itself does it all the time. Universal does it all the time. They yeah. look at each other, right? Because they know the value in um, taking uh, both the institutional memory and development and hard work of others and adapting it for themselves. 100%. Why, why, why start at zero when you don't have to? 100%. Well said, brother. Well said. Well, I just want to say... It's been an honor serving with you all. <laughs> A fantastic, fantastic show. We dove into the people mover. Fantastic... Um, information from i am tigger too really blew my mind um hopefully we can get him on the show one day because i just uh, really would like to pick his brain on that That'd we'll see great. we'll That'd see be great yeah it, and i you know if if, if uh, we have tried reaching out maybe unsuccessful i don't know i i i, I okay if anybody's interested in that i don't know maybe uh, you know, uh, throw our name out there if you if you yeah. if you if you uh, you know uh, you know want you want them to come on and say hey look the OG guys they'd like to like to see you yeah. doing a respectful way guys but but yeah. but but you know hey um, we job. have been on yet uh, successful unsuccessful but uh, we'd love to we'd love to talk to them because that yeah. I think that would be a really really fun conversation for oh, sure it'd be a blast it'd be an absolute blast and and it was a great show today with all the content creators I think. Probably 99% of these, a lot of people have n have never heard of. We brought t attention to the audience, which I think is fantastic. Um, really, really fun show, Dre. I want to thank you so much for coming on again, brother. If you could let everybody at home know where they could find you on social media, sir. Hey, best place to find me is going to be uh, on Twitter. It's go right there, at Vash Sky, um, as you saw earlier in the show. Like I said, uh, for all the robust discussion as christine wastelands mccarthy yeah. would say you got that drop for me oh yeah i got that drop hold on one sec let me go ahead and grab that drop mm -hmm. 
And there's the biggest bargain of all. Ah, I love it. If you know, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but as you saw earlier in uh, part of the show, sometimes the comments, discussions that we have on Twitter, or or, or, or things you you, know, you bring to my attention, or comments that you 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 you, you tweet to me or something like that, whatever. A lot of times it can make for content that we feature on the show. So please go ahead and keep that coming. Keep keep the follows up and. Uh, I, I do appreciate that for sure. And if you want to see me, well, it's going to be on the channel you're watching right now at Orange Grove 55 at Freshly Squeezed, your source for juicy news and info squeezed fresh right from the Grove. Let's see. There you go. That's perfect. Absolutely perfect. And thank you all so much for watching. Comment down below about your opinions of all the content creators that we feature today. I'd love to, we would love to hear your opinion on that. Um, also, the People Mover. Fascinating information about the the structural um, you know, uh, what would you call that? A structural, um, integrity of it. Integrity. Yeah. Great way. Uh, structural integrity of that track, which, Hey, fans have believed for decades that it's, it's not safe. And, uh, this guy worked on that track or it was, uh, licensed out to kind of, uh, uh, you know, look Examine. into it and, yeah. and he saw nothing wrong with it. It is it, perfectly safe. So, interesting conversation there comment down below we would love to hear from you and as always have a wonderful wonderful day thank you very much Ooh.